Duke D R R twenty fifty nineteen forty eight nineteen forty nine. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project, available in video and in written form, made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is also welcome and appreciated. This was the second radio restoration of this hobby project that started in 2021. This restoration has been revised in 2023 for safety reasons and this documentation likewise. Some choices of the first restoration are now regrettable, but only safety amendments have been applied in the revision due to the fragile condition of this unit. The original documentation consists only of the schematic diagram, which however contains a typo because it mentions three vacuum tubes requiring 12.6 volts for the filaments, while instead the correct types need 6.3 volts. This radio suffered from significant damage that, among others, destroyed the tube 50L6. At the time of the initial restoration, that tube was not available and was wrongly thought to be unobtinium. Therefore, it was made the plan to use a tube 6V6 instead with some adaptation on the schematics. What you see is the final schematic diagram, including the safety measures that will be discussed later in this video. I feel the need to apologize for the mistakes I made in the initial restoration, which are still documented in this revised video. Anyhow, it all allowed me to learn and improve. The chassis was already separated from the radio cabinet. The first thing to do for this particular unit is to remove the vacuum tubes, test their filament and put them in a safe place. Unfortunately, two of them are burned and the others show severe signs of stress in their filaments. Also, a dial light bulb is burned, which gives the clue that the last time the radio suffered an overvoltage, probably due to a wrong input voltage selection. Under the chassis, the situation is not much better. A couple of capacitors exploded. It is possible to notice that, before the last damage, the radio received substantial servicing. Some capacitors have been replaced in the late 60s, early 70s. The intermediate frequency transformers are connected through wires that are losing their insulation. The only way to distinguish their connections is via the wire color, which is also reported in the original schematic diagram. Therefore, to remove the intermediate frequency transformers, it is absolutely necessary to take note of which color each wire has or is supposed to have according to the schematics. It is now time to remove the knobs and all the dial components. Unfortunately, the screws are rusty and one of the knobs is partly damaged. The dial glass is also broken, but that happened before this process of recovery. An accurate reconstruction of the dial scale was made by Alessandro Depoy, Depoy.net. All the iron parts of the dial are rusty. They will need significant treatment. Due to the overall poor condition of the radio, it seems to be appropriate to start dismantling all the components, leaving at the moment only the RF area intact.
Even though there is an official schematic diagram of the radio, it is important to write down where exactly the components are connected. That would be very helpful in the process of rebuilding it. The space under the chassis of this radio is occupied for one-third by the radio frequency section, which does not have an isolated module. The remaining space is very narrow and, because of that, everything becomes complicated. Some important connections that are not at the same potential as the chassis ground are wired without insulation. In particular, the anodic positive voltage line B plus is not insulated at all. The process of dismantling progresses slowly, trying to understand, at each step, how it would be more appropriate to proceed. In the end, everything is removed, including the radio frequency parts, the power transformer, and even the tube sockets, leaving the small chassis completely naked. The chassis and all other iron parts are cleaned from rust and paint residues soaking in white vinegar for 24 hours. Then they are washed, dried and sprayed with a zinc paint. In the meantime, the tuning capacitor is washed in the dishwasher and also the radio frequency coils are rinsed in the same way. But, for the RF coils, the dishwasher will prove later to be too hard. Rebuilding the radio starts almost from scratch. The first thing to be done is to put in place the tube sockets and the input voltage selector. It is immediately clear that the input voltage selector should not be connected because the terminal could touch the chassis creating a short circuit. When the tube sockets and the voltage selectors are in place, the next thing to be done is to start connecting the chassis ground where possible. This radio in particular used a thick wire connected to different points to the chassis to ensure that the ground was easily accessible for all components, even though the space under the chassis is so narrow. After connecting the pins of the sockets that must be grounded, it is the turn of the heater's power supply. This radio used a 50L6 tube, requiring 50 volts for the heaters. However, this tube is burned because the plan is to replace it with the 6B6 or similar tube with a 6.3 volts heater, the wiring is made accordingly. This radio does not have a proper RF module. Everything is just attached around the range switch, occupying the space in the middle of the chassis. It has been absolutely necessary to figure out exactly what every connection was in comparison with the schematic diagram because it is otherwise impossible to just keep the module together. Most wires are replaced and all of them are insulated. The radio frequency components are installed again in the chassis and the last wiring is done. Before proceeding further, Everything is checked with the help of a multimeter, because correcting mistakes later would be more difficult. In fact, the medium wave's antenna coil does not appear connected to the chassis ground. As already mentioned, the dishwasher was too much for this coil. The coil is uninstalled again and the unattached termination is discovered. The connection is fixed and the coil can be installed again under the chassis. The intermediate frequency transformers that have been removed in the beginning can now be rewired keeping the same color code.
The two IF transformers are different and must be distinguished. The second IEF transformer has one shielded connection. In that case, the shield must be connected to the chassis. The loudspeaker is involved with the anodic voltage used in the radio, V+. Therefore, it becomes the next step in the process of rebuilding the radio. The double electrolytic capacitor should be removed after so many years, even though there is not yet any trace of deterioration. In fact, it appears that the capacitor has a higher capacity than what is prescribed by the schematic and the 6x5 tube. It is possible that that is not the original one, although it comes from the same manufacturer. The old capacitor can is emptied, with the hope of being able to put two new capacitors inside, keeping the aesthetic. Unfortunately, the two new capacitors cannot fit in that space, so in the initial restoration the shape of the old double capacitor is rebuilt with paper, cotton, and aluminum foil. Later, all that will be removed for safety reasons. These clips showing the early unfortunate reconstruction of the filter capacitor can are kept only for memory and for fun. Please don't do the same. That would seriously compromise the safety of your projects. In the revision of the restoration, the two filter capacitors are installed without trying to imitate the original capacitor can, using instead captain tape to keep them together, but without obstructing the vents. The continuity of the voice coil is tested, and it is found that even that is damaged. The already partly damaged cone is removed to see if there is a chance to recover the voice coil. In fact, the connection burned outside the coil, but that could not be seen without removing the cone. A recovery is attempted. Unfortunately, a cheap solution is tried for the cone using vinylic glue. This experimental attempt will turn into a horror, as the use of vinylic glue will prove later to be really unfortunate. The glue will reach the magnet sticking definitely to it, and to the coil making any further recovery attempt impossible. This radio model was designed without a fuse, but that is necessary, as demonstrated by the extension of the damage that this particular radio suffered. Therefore, a fuse must be added to the radio. At this stage of the initial restoration, the fuse holder is left hanging outside the chassis because the space under and above the chassis is busy enough, and there would be no other suitable place. But, in the revision of the restoration, there will be two fuses instead, and they will have a proper place. Even though there are no detailed videos regarding it, the installation of the last components under the chassis is completed. Due to the lack of space under the chassis, no attempt is made to make them appear as replicas. The radio will be tested with the help of an isolation transformer and dim bulb, and the chassis will be connected to the external ground for safety purposes. However, when the radio will not be used with the assistance of an isolation transformer, the external ground will have to be separated from the chassis. Before trying anything else, the voltage of the filaments is tested, and the same is for the voltage feeding the rectifier. Also the DC voltage after the rectifier is checked, 
but at the moment without more load all the measurements seem to be too high. At this point there are only three vacuum tubes available. The other two are burned. Therefore the work cannot be completed. However, as the oscillator converter tube is still alive, it is possible to test the local oscillator, which seems to be working and that is promising. When the replacement tubes are available, the alignment process can begin. A modulated signal at 462 kHz is used to peak the intermediate frequency transformers first. Other frequencies are used to align the dial scale for the medium and short wave bands. But at this stage, without a working dial scale, this part of the alignment was premature. And in fact, it will be repeated later, but off camera. Once the intermediate frequency transformers and the other coils are tuned, the ferrite cores are blocked with some wax. However, what you see here is definitely excessive. In the revision of this video, these clips are kept for memory, but please don't do the same. As mentioned before, unfortunately the attempt to repair the loudspeaker failed in an unrecoverable way. The ruined cone is removed to make space for a smaller loudspeaker. In fact, even in the revision of the restoration, this solution is kept because a new 6-inch loudspeaker would not have a suitable frame that could allow mounting the final audio transformer and the filter capacitor can. However, the glue alone cannot hold the inner loudspeaker in place. Therefore, a piece of plywood recovered from a vegetable box is used to let the inner loudspeaker sit properly, holding on to the external frame of the original loudspeaker. The dial cord is also installed, replacing the old one with a 0.5 mm fishing line. The wood used for the cabinet of this radio model is of fairly good quality. The front panel and the veneer are made of burl wood. The cabinet has been cleaned and treated just with wood wax and later also red oil. The original grill cloth was made of some plastic which was in an awful condition. It has been replaced with a thick piece of green fabric made for upholstery. The original dial glass was broken. Initially, the dial scale has been printed on a glossy sheet to be applied at the back of a new clear dial glass. But later, it was reprinted on thin cardboard and put at the back of the dial pointer, which made it more visible. A clear dial glass has been reproduced using acrylic glass. This radio model has a chassis connected directly to the mains. In the original configuration, the power switch is inserted between one external line and the chassis without knowing the polarity. To make the chassis safer, it would be necessary to use a polarized power plug and to connect the chassis to the neutral line, inserting the power switch in the hot line. Therefore, the unpolarized power plug has been modified, incorporating an LED that would become bright if there is a current passing between the supposed neutral line and the external ground, 
which would mean that the line is not neutral, but hot. This is how the orientation of the plug must be verified every time that is inserted. This is wrong. Correct. In the radio cabinet there is some extra space where a relay is added so that trying to connect the power plug with the wrong polarization the radio would be completely disconnected from the mains. Please notice the presence of two fuses rated for different current loads. In fact, ideally, the neutral line should not have a fuse because the chassis should remain connected to it even when a fuse blows. However, the power plug could be connected inverting the polarity, and there could be a problem already between that line and the ground, which might not blow the other fuse. Therefore, this additional fuse is there only to reduce the hazard of fire blowing only on exceptional conditions. This radio was made to function with maximum 220 volts AC, while instead current mains voltage in Europe is 230 volts. To drop some voltage and protect the radio from initial current surges, a small halogen light bulb is also inserted in series with the mains. The light bulb is rated for 230 volts, dissipating 60 watts. Because sudden current surges are prevented by this light bulb in series, the fuse inserted in the hot line can be rated only F0.1 amps, because in practical terms it would blow only at about 800 milliamps. Also due to these modifications that rely on the voltage provided by the mains of being about 230 volts. The voltage selector of this unit is disconnected and the radio could not be operated with any AC voltage lower than the range 220-240 volts. Finally, an informative label to be attached on the back panel is necessary to give instructions to a possible new user. But an additional label folded on the power cord near the plug could also be a good idea. As already mentioned previously in this video, this particular item has been modified to use a vacuum tube type 6B6 in place of the 50L6. To reduce the current required from the 6.3 volts output of the power transformer, instead of the original dial bulbs, a single one operating at 230 volts AC has been installed. Here is also the current limiting halogen light bulb in series. And here are the two fuses and the relay added for safety. The reconstruction of the previous ownership of this radio is incomplete, but it could be still meaningful for the next owners. This radio was found in 2021 in an old warehouse together with an annotation regarding some work done on it. Unfortunately, that annotation has been lost. The radio was in very bad condition as already described, but also partly dismantled, probably in the hopeless effort of fixing it. A couple of names have been written with a pencil, witnessing previous servicing. After the restoration, it is possible that this radio will be around for a long time surviving us. Therefore, I think that keeping a label inside the cabinet with the names of the last known owners could add value to it for the next collectors. For safety reasons in this documentation, the names are not shown in full. There is another name after mine. This is because I have already donated the radio to a friend. The Duke ADRR 2050 radio is ready. Medium wave.
Short wave. This must be a number station using single sideband modulation. This radio has already found a new home. I donated it to a friend. The new owner should be aware of the basic attention that is needed using old electronics and this radio in particular. Plug orientation. When you insert the power plug in the power outlet or an extension socket, please try both ways and verify that the LED becomes bright in one and only one of the two alternatives. If the LED is always bright, or if it is always dark, something is wrong and the radio should remain unplugged. The radio should not be used. Otherwise, please choose the orientation in which the LED remains dark. Who can operate the radio? Don't let a child operate this radio.
don't let anybody else operate this radio unless they are completely aware of the hazards and of the responsibility that they take in doing it. General Common Sense Caution All metal parts are connected to the mains even when the radio is turned off do not touch any metal part before removing the plug from the mains. If a radio knob comes off, remove the plug before trying to put the knob back in place. Never insert any object, neither a liquid, through the holes of the panel that covers the back of the cabinet. Do not use water, nor inflammable agents, in the proximity of the radio. Do not operate the radio with wet hands. This radio can never be placed in a bathroom or in other places near sinks, showers, or bathtubs. This radio develops heat. Do not operate the radio near potential inflammable objects, including curtains. Do not cover the radio. The radio must have enough space around and above for cooling airflow. Do not let the radio playing unattended for a long period of time. This radio is like a little oven, and there is some fire hazard. Power This radio can operate between 220 and 240 volts AC only with an effective ground connection and a neutral line. Do not use an adapter that does not provide a ground connection. The safety measures that have been implemented for this radio would be useless. There are two fuses to protect against fire hazards. If one fuse blows, it must be replaced with the same ratings. In particular, the fuse with the higher current rating must be inserted in the neutral line. If you would like to contribute to this project, donating old electronics equipment, or old radios in whatever condition they might be, provided that you do not feel any attachment that could be helpful for my next restoration documentation and video production.